Welcome to the Risk Management Chapter 12 Lecture. I am Dr. Bill Perkins, and today we're going to be covering Crisis Information Management Systems. The material for this lecture was taken from the textbook Business Continuity and Risk Management, Essentials of Organizational Resilience by Kurt Engelman and Douglas Henderson. So we're going to get started. And these are the Chapter 12 objectives. So we're going to identify the importance of effective information management during crisis. We're going to identify the roles that information systems play in managing crisis. We're going to review how information systems are used before, during, and after an emergency. We're going to review various technologies that underlie crisis information management systems. Then we're going to examine the contributions and challenges of social media in the realm of information management during a crisis. And then we're going to review some institutional initiatives that contribute to crisis response and management. So while no two emergency situations are alike uh, when disasters strike, the ability to share and communicate accurate and timely information is most uh, often a key goal in response and recovery efforts. So this chapter is going to highlight why a typical emergency scenario creates such a dire need for the ability to effectively manage information. Now the atmosphere that ensues during a crisis situation is typically very complex and uncertain. Although we can never predict exactly how events will unfold, there are a number of elements that are common among crisis scenarios. Now, these characteristics impact the way that information systems should be designed to help manage information during a crisis. So, first, we have multiple agents with no single authority. So, in many crisis scenarios, the impact of an event is multifaceted, especially when effects are widespread and there will be a number of agents who will assume some level of responsibility for addressing the event and its ramifications. Uh, depending on the nature of the event, these agents might include your local police, volunteer groups, uh, private business, civilian organizations, and federal authorities. Now, for any or all of these agents to collaborate effectively toward recovery, information must be shared among them. Uh, therefore, crisis information must be collected and transmitted in a format that is accessible to all potential agents. Uh, proprietary data formats would not be conducive to this type of information sharing. Um, it's got to be something that is more generic, um, not so proprietary. Uh, so now we have a multiple uh, sources of data, you know, data that is used by agents uh, during a crisis comes from many different sources, oftentimes numerous sources at once. Again, depending on the nature of the crisis, uh, those sources of data may include uh, civilian reports, uh, National Weather Agency, uh, emergency response organizations, and local government. So when data is obtained from many different sources, it must be managed in a unified manner so that it can be um, consider together, you know, and, uh, you know, kind of um, dovetail into one um, single source or nucleus of data, if you will. Uh, therefore, crisis information systems must have a means to consolidate uh, information coherently. Now, in regards to rapid staff turnover, um, Uh, responders to a crisis are often um, operating under high levels of stress and under extreme time pressure. So they will likely put in 14 to 18 hours of work at a time. Under these circumstances, it is expected that responders will take shifts so that they can take breaks. In longer term recovery efforts, contract workers are stationed for a few months at a time and replaced with little uh, to no transition. Since the group of responders continually changes, an ideal crisis information system keeps a history of the activities and communications of the responders so that newcomers can be fully informed. Usually there's um, some type of a checklist or um, a turnover briefing 
uh, that's uh, administered uh, when you have these changeovers. And finally, um, we have the rapidly changing environment. As crises unfold, unexpected developments are bound to occur. It is not always possible to plan for the roles that people will take during crisis, especially as the situation continues to evolve. Um, the information management system used must be adaptive and flexible to accommodate unforeseen circumstances. So remember that all these aspects of a crisis scenario help define the requirements for the system that are used to collect, disseminate, and share information among crisis responders. Now to counter counteract the atmosphere that exists during crisis, as described above, um, when I say above the previous slide, um, information systems that are used during these times fill a number of different functions. And these functions uh, include, uh, first you have decision making. So in an uncertain environment, decisions must be made quickly. Decision support systems can be applied in numerous ways to help decision makers make either tactical or strategic decisions. For tactical decisions, for example, uh, simulations or forecasting applications are useful in deciding how to proceed logistically in, in the event of a crisis. However, strategic decisions tend to be based on unique circumstances and uh, tactical knowledge that could not have been codified or uh, codified into a algorithm. Now, decision tools to support these types of decisions might instead focus on identifying and balancing objectives. Um, in, a, in crisis situations, decision support systems should compensate for the fact that data comes from many different sources and is highly susceptible to error. A decision support system that can identify conflicting data and report it to the decision makers will result in decisions that most accurately reflect the uncertainty involved in the situation. So decision support systems that monitor and record the decision making processes and are collaborative in nature will ensure that there is a shared perspective among all the various agencies that are involved with decision making during emergency response. Now in institutional memory, um, is next. So in crisis environments, in order for the recovery operations to be successful, uh, work processes need to progress in a way that is independent of the people who are carrying out the tasks. So since it is impossible to know with certainty who will be filling which roles at what times, work processes must flow from one worker to the next seamlessly. The capacity for an information system to capture and store knowledge that has already been discovered and tasks that have already been accomplished is what we refer to as institu institutional memory and is crucial to this process. Uh, information systems that provide institutional memory help staff who are arriving on scene to be fully informed without uh, taking too much precious time. Now, in addition, although each crisis presents a unique combination of challenges, commonalities provide lessons to be learned, particularly at a global level, and information systems capacity to store past decisions and the factors that contributed to them affords the global community the opportunity to not repeat mistakes that have been made in the past. So this type of decision audit um, also can be useful in helping to understand what occurred in the aftermath of a disaster. Now, moving on to coordination, uh, the ability to share information and knowledge is extremely important to facilitate the coordination among the many agencies that are potentially fa uh, all facing the same challenges. So without an organized way to coordinate their activities, uh, resources and time can be wasted on redundant efforts while others go un unaddressed. Um, proper communication between agencies allows them to make plans and decisions with up-to-date information and adequate uh, knowledge from other parties involved. Now, finally, we have situational awareness um, especially where the impact of a crisis is widespread, 
uh, information systems provide the ability to gather information about the totality of the event, uh, keeping everybody up to date, even at the uh, distributed sites, is key to being well prepared and responding swiftly and appropriately to developments. This is also especially important in keeping independent actors aware of each uh, other's activities. So in summary, the need for information technology during a crisis is created by the emergency and uncertain nature of the scenario where many players are involved and things are continually changing. Uh, essentially, the ability to communicate, store, process, and share information to support these circumstances is the value that information technology adds to a crisis scenario. So in addition to having application to an organization's operations, information technology has application to community emergency response efforts. Information technology has been used in a myriad of um, different ways to address crisis at all stages of their development. These uh, systems are tools to assist in preparing for a crisis before it occurs, responding to it during the event, and recovering after the crisis has struck. Uh, these stages of crisis management are also known as preparedness, response, and recovery. So first we're going to address uh, preparedness. Now specifically, early warning and communication systems. So part of dealing with a crisis is being prepared uh, for it before it occurs, of course. Uh, information systems have been useful in this effort to increase response effectiveness in advance of an emergency situation. There are three stages of preparedness at which these early warning systems play a critical role. These stages are monitoring, forecasting, and alerting potential victims of an impending disaster. So first we have monitoring. Early warning systems are designed to continuously measure and monitor uh, the precursors of a catastrophic event. Monitoring might utilize technologies such as satellite imaging and land and sea-based sensors. Uh, next, you have forecasting. Uh, early warning systems um, also include the capability to conduct... Oh, sorry plugging in my computer. Um, early warning systems also include the capability to conduct uh, scientific analysis to forecast a catastrophic event based on the patterns and trends in the detected uh, risk factors. These analysis uh, might utilize techniques such as statistical analysis, computer modeling, and simulation. Um, next we have alerts. Once an early warning system has de detected a potential catastrophic event, it sends out an alert to potentially affected parties. With current innovations in technology, the focus in this area has been to close the gap in the last mile and get the message across to the people who need it the most. This involves utilization of existing telecommunication systems or the dedication of the new ones. Next, we have response. So this involves emergency notification and dispatch systems. So as soon as an emergency situation arises, responders must take swift action to alleviate the impact as quickly as possible. Information systems can be used in the moments immediately following an emergency event by coordinating the response to that event. Finally, we have recovery. Once a crisis is under control, focus turns from mitigating immediate danger to recovering normal life and rebuilding affected areas. Uh, information systems are playing an important role in at this stage as well. Many of the systems that are used for early warning uh, also have uses at this stage. Uh, systems that monitor and collect information about the risk factors in an area continue to identify risks and monitor the safety of that area. Mapping, imaging, 
and geographic systems are also used to report the current status of an infrastructure so that damage can be assessed and recovery efforts or recovery activities um, can be allocated appropriately. They can also be used to monitor displaced persons and coordinate continued aid. So remember, in the preparedness stage of a crisis management, um, you know, you have your early warning systems. Uh, first monitor, um, continuously measure the precursors of that catastrophic event. Uh, next, you have your forecast, um, conduct scientific analysis to predict a catastrophic event based on the patterns and trends in the detected risk factor. And then finally, you have alert, and that's get the message to the people who need it the most. Okay, next, moving on to people-centered approach. Uh, communication technologies ensure warnings get to at-risk people in a way that they can be understood and trusted. Um, I want to highlight uh, that getting that message out is, um, is not nearly enough. Okay, so the people-centered approach to disaster preparedness uses information and communication technologies to ensure that early warnings get to all people who are at risk in a way that they can be understood and trusted and that the appropriate actions are taken in response to the information. Information in education centers where people can learn about risks they face and how to proceed in the, in the event that an early warning is you, issued are, uh, you know, it's one way to keep all people informed. Uh, all types of broadcasting media are also uh, potential technologies for dissemination of information that at-risk communities need to be prepared for an emergency. Now, the coordination of effort, which is often centralized at a command center, such as an emergency operations center, EOC or um, ECP, uh, necessitates the flow of information in two directions. So first, first is information flowing out of the centralized location, which includes notifying people in the affected re region who might be at risk and notifying the responders who should be dispatched to help them. Next is information flowing into the command center that consists of receiving communication from uh, throughout the affected area. In both cases, um, systems must be in place to facilitate the communication and be equipped to administer instructions to those in danger. Now, emergency notification systems that are used by many organizations store the information needed to contact all their members through numerous media and with various communication devices. Based on the circumstances of the event and its impacts, managers can use the system to blast notifications uh, to selected people through preferred means. Advanced systems will include rules for routing, prioritizing, and escalating notifications automatically. Now, the typical emergency dispatch system is designed to route first responders to where they are needed to provide assistance and supplies. The system typically receives communications from people in the field so that resources can be deployed most efficiently to where they are needed. Um, enhanced emergency dispatch systems will also automate the ability to give callers instructions on how to proceed based on the unfolding events that they are reporting. The information received from people in the affected area should ideally be recorded to determine the impact of the emergency event, perhaps mapping and or prioritizing reports of impact throughout the area. Collecting this information through a centralized system is cr a crucial step for the further analysis of the incident and the coordination of response actions. A crisis um, information management system, uh, a SIMS, uh, is a computer application that is used for aggregation and analysis of acts about uh, a crisis as it develops. 
So in fact, uh, often these systems are robust enough that they can be used to support many of the functions of a command center responding to an incident. While each actual implementation includes different features, some common SIMS features include an events log, um, reporting capabilities, response planning, resource management, notifications, situational arrangement, and organizational um, communications. Um, an important criterion for SIMS is to be flexible so that it can meet the needs of emergencies of various types, sizes, and scopes. It should also be based on open standards so that it can work together with the systems of other agencies and allow for the possibility that all users can't necessarily gain access to the same system during an emergency event. In many cases, the SIMS is a web-based and compatible uh, with handheld devices. And an added benefit of this is that it can serve as a virtual command center where people can update, retrieve, and communicate crisis-related information from distributed locations. And revisiting the recovery phase. Um, so, you know, help restore normal life and rebuild the affected areas. Um, you know, it involves continue to identify risks and monitor the safety of the area. Also, report the current status of the infrastructure. And finally, monitor displaced uh, persons and coordinate continued aid. Uh, often relies on the um, SMIS. Uh, message technology and cell phones. Okay, many of the uh, systems that are being put into place to help devastate a community rely on this short messaging service, SMIS, um, message technology. And this technology can be implemented to provide communication cap capabilities despite massive infrastructure damage. Now we're going to discuss some of the technologies that underlie the aforementioned systems, uh, allowing them to meet the information needs of emergency management. So we have another sip of coffee. First, we have geospatial systems. A majority of the information that is managed before, during, and after an emergency is geographic in nature. Sources of danger move rapidly, uh, affect large areas, and require intricate knowledge of the affected and surrounding areas in order to be addressed. Therefore, the ability to create an association between uh, data and geography is crucial in emergency management and response. Geographical Information Systems, GIS technology, facilitates this association, creating an interface to visualize analyze and model combinations of spatially referenced data. Many areas of emergency management depend on geospatial systems, those that use GIS technology to capitalize on the location elements of data. Uh, for example, you have hard analysis, um, computer generated maps uh, help emergency managers to better understand the geographic area under their jurisdiction. In the planning stages, emergency management can uh, use the maps to locate hazards such as earthquake faults or flood zones and identify potential emergencies. A map overlay feature allows analysis um, to simultaneously or analysts to simultaneously map more than one geographic data set. So by analyzing combinations of spatial data, emergency management personnel can identify areas of high risk where mitigation efforts and response plans might be focused. For example, a map that combines information about earthquake faults with information about pipelines and power lines can determine opportunities for utility companies to invest in mitigation to secure or bypass potentially affected areas. Now, on the web, mashups are um, applications that reuse and combine information from various sources and use it in different ways. So, location mashups are those um, that visually combine data with geographic information and similarly uh, prove 
uh, beneficial in the context of hazard analysis. Next, you have risk assessment, uh, data modeling, and geostatistics are capabilities of geospatial systems that allow them to uh, determine the probabilities and potential damage of certain events. So by mapping multi-dimensional information and combining it with other temporal da data, a geospatial system could model what the results of various conditions would look like. Geospatial systems that also incorporate geostatistical analysis tools will further allow observed patterns to be incorporated, measuring the probability of events to help predict events and assess risk. During an actual uh, emergency, modeling the speed and direction of environmental movement, such as wind, can determine the next locations that will be in danger and require assistance, such as from a, um, a spreading fire. Um, next, you have operational decisions. Rapid access to visually displayed geospatial information can also be instrumental in logistical operations during an emergency. Uh, they can help quickly plan response procedures so that geographical factors can easily be considered in creating evacuation routes and rescue strategies. Geocoding, a technique that allows geospatial systems to associate geographic locations with addresses, is also useful in managing emergency operations in residential areas. And next we have real-time monitoring. Situational awareness is enhanced when a geospatial system, system can be updated in real time, giving a visual representation of the situation as it changes. So management uh, can then use this information to coordinate and make decisions about the next steps for a response. Uh, advanced vehicle locating, AVL, can track deployed responders locations uh, responsibilities and find the nearest mobile units to be dispatched. Uh, mobile uh, GPS and wireless technologies are all instrumental in creating dynamic geospatial information, gathering analysis and distribution. So we have seen that collecting, storing, analyzing, and disseminating information in an accurate and timely manner is the main goal of crisis information management. However, the combination of that information with experience and intuition is what we call knowledge. Encapsulating that knowledge in a systematic way so that it can be transferred from one person to another reused and applied to new situation is one of the challenges in disaster management um, in any scenario or case. Um, knowledge management systems are systems that help decision makers apply information uh, to situations in meaningful ways. Case-based reasoning is one technique that has been recommended to be applied in disaster management cases. This is a computer-based technique that allows knowledge management by systematically taking into account the circumstances of past cases to help apply solution in current cases. Um, other emergency management systems implement knowledge management by enhancing communications between experts and responders, so knowledge from past experience can be shared. In addition, uh, systems that are dynamic, allowing for the editing of rules, policies, and procedures based on experiences and lessons learned also help responders share and obtain knowledge. As discussed, decision uh, support systems, especially those that apply knowledge management techniques, can capture and process some knowledge based uh, on previous experiences. Disaster scenarios, however, are at times so uncertain and uh, non-routine that there is no previous experience to call upon. High risks, uh, time pressure, and limited resources uh, create a scenario where decision makers must act quickly based upon their intuition and implicit knowledge, which is much more difficult to automate. Artificial intelligence, or AI, systems 
are systems that can be programmed to behave as a uh, human being would. Um, an expert system, for example, is designed to emulate the thought processes of a human expert. Expert systems have been implemented for disaster management using subject matter experts and building systems to model their decision-making processes for all stages of disaster ma management. Port Blue is an example of a company that does this for incident management at hospitals. Artificial intelligence has also been applied to disaster management by applying all planning technology to crisis management tasks. Um, AI planning systems are designed to make choices to achieve a goal. Uh, they need to continually change their plans as circumstances change, mimicking um, reasoning under certainty. For example, since in real emergencies, decision makers are continually improvising their plans in this way, the cognitive process of impro uh, improvising has been studied modeled and implemented into a computer program. Now, one of the major challenges faced in the crisis management community is interoperability among the systems used by various agencies that are on the scene. So crises are complex and require the involvement of an unpredictable set of distributed teams from many different organizations and emergency managers from different jurisdictions. Therefore, it is not feasible to expect that everybody who needs to partake in a uh, crisis management effort will be able to access the same system. Differing uh, technology platforms and organizational procedures among the various organizations make this very unlikely. So to meet this challenge, uh, efforts have begun to create a standard protocol to facilitate communication between different SIMs and between SIMs and other systems used by crisis management organizations. So the Organization for Advanced Advancement of Structured Information Standards, OASIS, uh, OASIS in 2005 developed an XML-based standard called Common Learning Protocol, CAP to standardize alerts and warnings. The goal is to eventually be able to distribute warnings consistently over all available channels and to be able to monitor the whole picture of local, state, and national warnings at any one time. In addition, OASIS uh, is producing a group of XML standards called Emergency Data Exchange Language, EDXL, to standardize the transmissions of various types of emergency information. Now, the systems discussed um, in the previous slide are predominantly run and used by those who are providing emergency response and humanitarian aid and relief. They focus on a top-down flow of information. In bottom-up systems, however, Information flows from within the community affected by the disaster. Uh, the combination of increased availability of communications devices and the Web 2.0 tools, uh, the trends associated with those Web 2.0 tools of sharing user-generated content has allowed social media to become a viable tool in information management during a crisis. The goal in uh, crisis information management is to aggregate, uh, analyze, and share information easily, efficiently, and quickly. Yet traditional crisis information systems are closed, proprietary, and centralized, relying on members of the crisis management organizations to contribute information. The internet, however, over the years has proven to be a tool that can gather all forms of information from anybody who has access to it very quickly. The uh, current and potential implications for crisis information management thrive. Um, recall that situational awareness is one of the goals of crisis information systems uh, management systems. So response efforts are best directed by real-time information about the current situation. So what better way to get real-time status than from the people who are witnessing it firsthand? 
Uh, the current web trend of uh, sharing user-generated content creates a medium where people can let other people know what is going on through many different uh, media. Using these tools, individuals engage in citizen journalism as they share uh, their experiences, and they do this through various blogs, um, short uh, text updates like what you see on Twitter, photos like what you see on Facebook and Instagram, um, video like what you see on YouTube, um, video streams, which are popular on many of the platforms out there. So uh, the internet has afforded us uh, the opportunity to crowdsource situational awareness information. This means that it is create, it creating, um, its creation is outsourced to the general public. Um, the benefit of gathering information this way is that information collected is not restricted to designated officials. Information is gathered and shared by anyone and with everyone without interoperability issues, speeding up the process manifold. For example, citizen journalism was seen on Flickr uh, following Hurricane Katrina in the Gulf Coast in 2005 and using Twitter during the terrorist attacks on Mumbai, uh, India in um, 2008 and during the Middle East unrest in 2011. So it has been said that a whole is greater than a sum of its parts when it comes to knowledge creation. This implies that when an information-based effort is crowdsourced, the result reflects a more robust product an efficient process than if an individual had been assigned to obtain the information alone. The power of collective intelligence for the creation of situational awareness was evident in 2007 when a Facebook group successfully compiled an accurate list of casualties in the shooting at Virginia Tech hours before this information was available to the local authorities. Now, this is a concept beyond any uh, wiki where many people contribute to the creation and perfection of a knowledge base or problem solving task. Uh, crowdsourcing tools have been applied to the creation of knowledge for crisis information. Uh, for example, openstreetmap.org is a web-based application through which crowds could uh, update a map of the world. This can be used as a crisis, as a crisis unfolds to maintain a real-time awareness of the geographic impacts of a crisis. This tool was used after the uh, 7.0 magnitude um, earthquake that devastated Haiti in January of 2010. So a call to the OpenStreetMap.org uh, community spurred them to go to work updating the map of Haiti based on any information that they had access to. The up-to-date map could then be used to um, response and relief efforts. Uh, the prevalence of online social networks also proves to be useful for crisis management. Um, an online social network is characterized by shared connections between people who are organized into groups and share information objects such as messages, photos, videos, uh, notifications, current activities, uh, etc. Um, capitalizing on these links between people, social networking sites have already been used as notification systems uh, to get urgent messages out there to groups of people through status updates, wall postings, group discussions, and photo threads. The sheer numbers of users of social networking sites and the volume of information they share make social networking um, a premium opportunity for information gathering as a repository of relevant information during a crisis. The ability to tag information objects further provides a user-generated cataloging system that helps organize and filter the volumes of aggregated information. So the use of social media for crisis information continues to evolve. The opportunities are many, but challenges do exist. The main challenge that we face in adapting social media to crisis information context 
is the accuracy and verif um, verifiability of the information. Um, the to rely on informa uh, information for a crisis response, it must be trustworthy and authoritative. Uh, while user-generated crisis information is much more quickly obtained, there is an inherent trade-off between speed and verifi uh, verifiability. Um, opening the information gathering process to the general public opens opportunities for fraud. We see this a lot nowadays, uh, especially with COVID. And we also see political spins uh, being put on information uh, being shared. So the credibility of what we see uh, comes into question. Um, furthermore, the power of social media to spread information quickly among social networks uh, intensifies the impact of bad information. So that bad information or un, um, non-credible information is getting shared quickly. Um, some potential solutions to this challenge are to continue use of the technology but restrict its use to a bounded group of trusted individuals or to devise a technique for real-time validation. Uh, Cross-references to the same information on multiple platforms are some form of validation. So uh, progress in the areas of systems for management of crisis information is continually underway. As globalization pro uh, progresses, uh, progresses uh, technology advances um, and crises occur. Um, global crisis management initiatives will be an arena, an arena that is worthwhile to watch. Uh, many large technology organizations are investing or have invested in development in crisis management technology. Some of these initiatives uh, that have already, um, I mean, this is an ever evolving uh, market. Uh, nowadays, um, especially with COVID-19. Uh, so some of these have already um, been updated and may seem a little antiquated. Uh, not, nevertheless, uh, for purposes of the course in the textbook, we're going to cover these. Uh, Microsoft in 2006, the Microsoft uh, Corporation established a group that is dedicated to serving humanitarian causes bring in expertise and assistance in the form of collaboration software to areas throughout the world that are affected by a disaster. Now, what is unique about this group, the Microsoft Humanitarian Systems, MHS, is that they develop their humanitarian software at the actual site of the disaster. So software developers uh, actually live among the rescue workers which gives them real-time accurate and relevant needs and product design and development assessment. Next, you have IBM. IBM's crisis response team has been on the disaster response uh, science or scene since 1993, responding to disasters worldwide with technology resources, solutions, and volunteers. One of their notable contributions has been an open source web-based disaster management system that tracks information such as victim identification and donations of relief goods. IBM's team has also devised systems to help in other ways such as finding missing persons and helping victims um, you know in various uh, ways. Cisco uh, Systems Incorporated has been active worldwide in supplying post-disaster communities with relief. For example, their community uh, voice mail CVM program is a, uh, was a simple idea with big impact. The CVM gave a uh, phone number and a voice mailbox to people who have lost everything in a disaster to help them try to rebuild. In addition, Cisco's Worldwide Networking Academy made networking and communications education available to communities around the world so that struggling communities can obtain tools to help themselves. And finally, we have Strong Angel 3. Uh, in 2006, this was a third in a uh, three series of uh, training efforts in which a diverse group of first responders, military officials, and software and wireless 
experts got together to simulate a disaster experience. The drill, which lasted several days, was designed to practice collaboration among the different types of disaster response organizations, showcase and try new disaster response technologies, and teach disaster response communities some lessons that could be applied for real disaster response. So the uh, event was very unstructured to closely simulate an actual disaster environment where groups must self-organize in the absence of one leader. So that concludes our um, chapter 12 lecture. Please make sure you visit Blackboard for the chapter 12 deliverables and expectations, and I will see you in chapter 13.